I did ask you to talk for uh, just a few minutes, I think five is the actual time slot, so I'll speak quickly, um, about what's the actual problem. And then I would just preface that by saying that, that I came to uh, semantic web, RDF, et cetera, as a, a deep cynic. Uh, Eric called me two and a half years ago and said, we'd like to do co-share HCLS, and I said, yeah, I don't really want to do it, because I don't really think that anything you have actually works. I think it's probably interesting, fun to talk about, but it doesn't actually work. And he said, no, it really does. I said, yeah, I don't think so. And so he persisted and called me some more times. And we had several discussions. And finally, I said, OK, look, I'll do it for six months. But I want you to know that my stated goal is to convince myself and gather concrete evidence that it really doesn't work. And then I'm going to leave. And um, actually, it does work. Um, it's not perfect. But I think that it gives us something that we have never had before. And that's my five minute talk. Um, this is a diagram which is, if you look at the details, it's very cancer specific. It comes from the National Cancer Institute. But I think it captures the essence of the problem. And that is, if we really are going to move to personalized medicine, which is the, the goal that most people talk about, which integration of bedside dimension back and then beyond into populations, uh, we're talking about a whole bunch of stakeholders and a whole lot of data and a whole lot of possible interactions. And in order for that to be tractable and scalable in any way, shape, or form, we're going to have to start sharing data at a computational level. So um, there are some barriers to sharing uh, data at a semantic level. Um, and some of them are semantic and some of them are non-semantic. And I would just say that RDF and OWL and all of the machinery of the W3C and semantic web don't really solve the semantic problem. What they do is surface them in a way they've never been able to be surfaced before. And they do that by essentially eliminating what I call the non-semantic problems. So there's a lot of barriers, and I partition them into non-semantic barriers and semantic barriers. The non-semantic barriers actually sit around two subject areas. One is representation, and one is serialization. And it's not to say that they, we can't solve the problems of representation and serialization, but in, in non-semantic web t uh, technologies, those problems are harder to solve. They tend to be more one-off solutions, siloed solutions. Um, from a representation perspective, um, really there's sort of two issues. One is the notion of the gap between requirements and implementation. It's very hard, I suspect everyone in this room has done UML modeling. I've done a lot of work with domain experts in UML modeling. And one of the, the really sort of obvious but fundamental difficulties with domain experts understanding UML is that they think in terms of instances, but we model in terms of classes. So, you know, you can build instance diagrams, and you can get them to feel sort of comfortable, but it's never a natural paradigm that you build classes and work on instances. And what happens then is that as you move your way down, <coughs> excuse me, from requirements to implementation, there's a bigger and bigger chance for semantic gaps to occur. And of course, they do occur. The nice thing, of course, about RDF implementation or RDF uh, adoption of RDF and, and, and those tools is that you get a consistent design time, representation, serialization, exactly the same thing because you're representing the semantics, you're serializing the semantics. Um, the second issue is that um, because the schema and the data are separate from each other in virtually every, the, every other language, RDMF, RDBMS, um, UML, whatever, Again, you have this problem that there's the schema over here and then there's the data over here. And people in the clinical trial space and the healthcare space talk about the metadata and the data. And they are two different worlds, two different representations, two different implementations. And of course, you can overcome all that with RDF. And then finally, serialization. Um, <coughs> serialization, most of it's done in XML. XML is uh, notoriously brittle for uh, hierarchical differences. Um, I have an example that I always give about students, teachers, and classes, and I gave it recently at a talk. But you know, you build a simple UML model of students, teachers, and classes, and you say, well, if you're, how would you serialize that? If you're a student, you say, well, I'd serialize with students being the root class. If I'm a teacher, I serialize with teachers being the root class. If I'm an administrator, I serialize with administrator being the root class. And I said, you know, the problem is those three serializations, although they're semantically equivalent, you have to write some one-off XPath codes or XSLTs or something <coughs> to get at them. And a guy in the audience raised his hand. He said, well, that's not true at all. I said, really? I said, how would you solve the problem? He said, give everything a unique ID. Well, that's the beginning of semantic web, of course. <laughs> so <clears throat> why RDF? I think RDF is not magic. You guys, I suspect, all know that it's not magic. What it does, however, is put semantics on the table in a very clear way that they've never been, put on, been able to be put on the table before, 
without having to sort through a bunch of non-semantic issues. In other words, it takes the non-semantic issues off the table and lets us focus on the semantic ones. That's probably about six minutes, right? Okay, great. Thank you.